and it's 10 a.m. right here in Lagos, Nigeria. Good morning, good evening, wherever in the world you're watching from. It's Business Morning Live from Channels HQ. I'm Ladi Williams, and happy International Women's Day to all the women out there. Thank you for all you do to contribute to uh, society. But first off, now, let's um, look at what's happening um, in the markets. We see uh, oil prices uh, fill about $3 a barrel. Uh, after comments from U.S. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell stoked rate hikes, uh, the dollar strengthened and the top crude importer, China, uh, also uh, issued uh, weak data. We see there uh, Brent shed about $2.89 to settle at $83.29 a barrel, while the U.S. WTI uh, crude futures that dropped $2.88, about 3.6%, uh, to close at $77.58 per barrel. Those were the biggest single-day uh, percentage declines for both contracts since January 4th. See, Powell Dell told uh, uh, Congress the Fed would likely uh, need to increase rates more than expected in light of recent strong economic data pushing most commodities and uh, financial uh, markets lower. We see the Fed there looking for some bad economic news not getting it, thereby uh, hinting at more rate hikes uh, going forward. We'll keep tracking that uh, for the next uh, Fed meeting. And uh, back here in Nigeria, uh, we see uh, exports at, uh, of liquefied natural gas from Nigeria. That fell by 15% in 2022, and that's according to a new report by the International Energy Agency. In its gas market report for the first quarter of this year, uh, the Paris-based energy think tank says the amount, uh, which is the worst decline among other top LNG exporters on the continent, comes alongside with Algeria and Angola. However, the IEA uh, report mentions that LNG exports from Egypt increased by 10%, albeit at a much slower pace than last year. And the Minister of State for Trade and Investment, Ambassador Mariam Katagum, says government policy and the public procurement process must be made to work in favor of women-owned businesses. She made the remark at the third International Women's Day event in Lagos, put together by the Bank of Industry. Our correspondent, Bukola Samo, Wemimo, has the details in this report. It's the annual International Women's Day celebration put together by the Bank of Industry. Gathered here are women achievers from their different fields, including Nigeria's first female Minister of Trade and Investment, Chief Mrs. Nikia Kondi, the Director General of the World Trade Organization, Dr. Mrs. Ngozi Okonjo Weala, and the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, Mrs. Amina Mohammed, who joined virtually. This year's theme, Embrace Equity, tugs at the heart of issues that enhance gender inequalities, including lack of education, poverty, and lack of finance for entrepreneurship. The chief host of the event and Nigeria's Minister of State for Trade sets the tone for the occasion. We must foster the right conditions and capacities for every woman everywhere to realize her full economic potentials. At the policy level, we must ensure that trade policy works for women, including ensuring that public procurement also works for women, given the important role women play in the economy. At a women's forum as this, it is important for women to challenge self-imposed stereotypes. We eagerly look forward to when we shall have the first female Senate president or first female president in Nigeria. For the managing director of the Bank of Industry, inequity is the bane of marginalization of women and there is a need for better understanding of these issues. Gender equity works to correct the historical wrongs that have left women behind, such as cultural restrictions on education, employment, etc., towards eliminating the systemic and structural limitations that hinder the ability to thrive and develop. As of December 2022, the bank had disbursed 73 billion naira to women-owned or women-led businesses across various sectors of Nigerian economy. 
you think about the issues... The event then breaks into discussion segments featuring three sessions. During the third session, panelists, including the wives of the governors of Kebi, Yobe and Edo states, answer questions on government's response to issues affecting the girl child in their respective states. The first ladies are happy to bring progress reports on myriad issues, including the challenges of the burgeoning numbers of out-of-school children, period poverty for the girl child, and human trafficking. Because now Edo State has dropped from number one to about number six in Nigeria. Oh. Um, that's so just that within three years of, yes. of um, tackling the problem. Mm -hmm. One thing that struck out the most uh, was uh, menstrual hygiene amongst the girl's child. Mm -hmm. And going through the schools, I used to go around schools, we run a school health program. It appears there's an uncanny consensus among speakers here today that the twin issues of equality and equity must be addressed, especially in the areas that affect women. One being the need to help women surmount the gender stereotypes and other societal hurdles placed in the path of women in accessing resources and opportunities. Bukola Samuel Wemimo for Channels Television News. And still in the spirit of uh, celebrating women, let's uh, look at how women are performing in a rapidly uh, growing industry. That's talking about the uh, fintech industry. According uh, to a report, we see that um, uh, women make up about 29% of the uh, fintech workforce and they hold only 19% of uh, senior management uh, positions. Let's discuss the advancement of women in fintech. Join us now is uh, Lasbury Oludimu, Vice Presidential, uh, Vice President Legal, uh, Chief Data Protection Officer at Yellow Card uh, Financial. Join us via Zoom. Great to have you and uh, happy International Women's Day. Thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm so glad I'm here. Fantastic. So uh, what would you say is responsible for the, you know, gender gap in the fintech uh, industry? Is it that the men, you know, got there first? Thank you very much for this question. Um, I think before we talk about um, the root cause, it's very important we talk about um, where we find the gender gap, right? Um, you can say within the workforce, um, you know that the core team in the fintech industry, the engineering team, okay, you have other supporting team like the legal, the compliance, the finance team, and all of that. So if you look at um, 20 engineers, find about three, four women. And from, from the team, from the workforce, you can move to um, um, the senior leadership role. If you look at the senior leadership role within this fintech space, you can see that just a few women uh, given the senior leadership roles, right? And also, if you look at the, the, the female founders, okay, vis-a-vis -vis the male founders, if there are 200 male founders, if there are 200 founders, you can see that the women are about um, 10, 15, compared to the 20, the total number. And these also reflect in the user base, right? If you have um, a financial app and you take a survey of the people using that particular app, you can see that the women are, um, the, the number is quite low, right? So both from the workforce, the leadership role, the founders of these fintech entities and also the um, user base, the number of the field participants are quite low. Then let's go back to the question you asked, what's, what, what is the root cause? Okay, I can say that the root cause of this gender imbalance can be traced to the challenge of getting females into the STEM-related courses. What do I mean by the STEM-related courses? You see the science courses, the technology, the engineering, courses related to mathematics and all that. If you go to classes in the university, you can see that you see a very few number of women in these classes. And at the end of the four years, we turn out the set of um, graduates and they are the ones within the labor market. They are the ones asking for these positions in the fintech industry. And at the end of it, once you receive 20 applications for the engineering um, post, you can see um, two, three female applying for the same position just like the female. So I can say that the, let's go back to the fundamentals, which is 
trying to get our women, trying to get our young women into the STEM related courses. And once we try doing that, that will increase the number of women within the, within the fintech industry. And also what also uh, reduces the number of female founders is access to financial support. These female founders, they, they, they find it difficult to raise funds. They don't have the support they need, just like the male folks. So at the end of the day, you find out that you see business are scaling and you look at the founders, you look at the CEOs, they are all male um, members. And, and you're asking yourself, how about the female um, founders that started this business with these people? So the, the female, the female gender, they don't have the kind of access to funding like the male genders also have. Then going over to the user base, you can see that the user base is a typical reflection of what is happening within the employment space and also the leadership pro, because you can only use what you understand, right? If you don't understand an app because you don't have that knowledge, it will be difficult for you to really use that app or even get to uh, uh, get the benefit out of the app. So the fundamentals, the foundation is we have challenges getting our young female students into the STEM-related uh, courses, and this and, and, happens uh, gradually. Um, and, and talking about the young uh, uh, girls, you know, attending, you know, these uh, STEM classes, uh, could it also be that you know most of them don't really have interest, you know, in these classes? Yes, it, it might be that most of them don't have interest in these classes, but we need to start building an interest in them. Okay, it all starts from the young age. It all starts from the basic, the, the primary school, the secondary school. Recently, um, I can tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm so amazed seeing the, the work products that my kids bring back from STEM clubs, right? Um, they make disco lights, they make fun, they make telescope. So at that young age, the school already has that in their curriculum, trying to build up that interest. So we need to build up, build in the interest from the young age. We don't need to force anybody in the university to take up a STEM related course, but we need to start doing it from the basic. We need to start doing it from the primary school. We need to start doing it from the secondary school. Gradually we'll build interest in these young ladies. And by the time they get to the university level, they'll definitely have interest to study courses within that STEM um, um, field. And that would help us at the end of the four years course, at the end of the four or five year course, we will have a good number of um, um, young female applying for these jobs within the fintech entity. So we need to start building the, the interest from the basic. All right, let's look at, and you know. You also asked, how do we, sorry, you also asked, how do we address this? Yes. Um, I think I've mentioned it earlier. We need to encourage our young women to get into the STEM field rest. In terms of employment, we also need to give the women more opportunity. Okay, I know of an I know of a fintech entity. When you recommend an engineer and the engineer is successful during the interview section and get the job, you get a fee for it. Now we need to turn it around. Instead of saying go get us a, 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 an engineer that is capable of doing this job, we we'll say go get us a female engineer that is capable of doing this job. So if I'm getting $200 for getting an engineer in that post, I'm going to get $400 getting a female engineer into that position. So by the time you know it, in a year or two, we have more women within the engineering team and the number of women in the fintech definitely increased. Okay, well, let's uh, look at, you know, businesses, you know, led by uh, fintech businesses, led by female uh, founders. Do they, do they hire more women? Um, I, I think the, the focus now is not, is not um, on gender. The focus is hiring who can do this job, who is the best fit, right? So whether the founder is a female or whether the founder is a male, what the company is looking for is who is going to help us do this, who is going to help us um, uh, bring out this product in, in an innovative way. So whether you're a female or you're a male, the focus is we need to get this job done whether it's a female that can do it or a male that can do it, we need to get this job done. So irrespective of the gender of whoever is the founder, it does not really affect whether there are more women in the um, space or whether there are more men. All they are looking for is who can do this job for us. 
All right, let's look at uh, funding. Now, we saw in Africa, Nigeria led, you know, the pack, uh, the big four, uh, when it comes to uh, attracting uh, funding into Africa. Nigeria led that, uh, raising a record amount. And, you know, looking at uh, the, uh, the, the leaders in some of these companies, some of them are, are, are male-dominated. What do you, how, how are female founders, you know, being treated when it comes to, you know, raising funds and uh, attracting those uh, VC, uh, VC investors? Okay, um, maybe I should tell you about a survey I saw on LinkedIn. Maybe that, that would be a very good starting point. Um, so I, I saw the survey on LinkedIn and the, by Afric Digest, and the title is 24 Founder CEOs who have raised over $3 million in Africa. Okay, so this survey, the report came up this, this year, and they are talking about 24 founder female CEOs in Africa. That's the continent, not just in Nigeria. So the survey was done, and we could only get 24. Out of these 24, we have nine Kenyan female founders. Um, we have six Nigerian female founders. We have three Ghanaian female founders, and we have two South African female founders. The rest of the four slots were for other four countries, and they had just one um, female founder. Who have raised this number? Who have raised more than $3 million? Okay. And this fundraising is not just, uh, um, it's not just pre-seed. Some of them have actually gone through the pre-seed, they have gone through the seed, they have gone through series A, they have gone through series B, and one in South Africa has even gone through series B2. Okay, so when you compile all the funds they have raised, you're talking about $5 million, $11 million, when the male folks can just do a pre-seed and raise up to $15 million or $11 million. Okay, so you can see that the number is quite poor. And... Um, I can say that the female funders are taking the lion's share. They are taking it all. Okay. And the same survey also uh, mentioned that less than a third of VC funded startups have female um, founders and less than a fifth of venture um, backed startup CEOs in the ecosystem are women. So the vast majority of 85% are male. Okay, so you can see it, it, it's a big problem sourcing for fund if you're a female um, founder um, across the continent. Women who are both um, chief executives and founders of um, startups, they have issues. They have uh, um, um, bigger hurdles to cross when it comes to raising funds. And for you to get this number of funds being raised, it's exceedingly rare. So for, for the fintech space, it's difficult for the female founders to, to actually respond to scale up. So and, I think and also, it's, it's a challenge for the founders. Uh, knowing that uh, globally, uh, 2022 was uh, quite challenging for uh, some kind of a uh, funding contraction, you know, last year with mm -hmm. uh, the central bankers uh, raising rates. But um, uh, tell me now, what, what uh, perspective do, do the uh, women bring to the fintech industry? Is there any unique perspective they, they bring in? Okay, I, I, I would say yes, um, there, there is a unique um, pr um, perspective that women do bring within the fintech space. We all know that um, women are deep thinkers when it comes to financial issues, financial matters. We don't just um, jump at it. We take our time, we think through before we take a decision. Um, um, so that, that's one thing special about having um, um, the, the, the women within the leadership role because they think differently and they have a different perception about issues and all that. Let me give you an example. Um, I had these three colleagues, right? Um, and they had a meeting about an issue. And I think after the meeting, they said, okay, let's bring in Lasbury. And um, they shared another call. They brought me in and they told me, okay, this is what has happened. And we, we think this, we think that, and we think we should do this. What do you think, right? And I, I, I go on and I say, oh, I think this happened because of this. And I think, ju just give it my own view, right? And one of them said, wow, I never thought of this. And I know that that person said, this is so deep, right? So it, it's it's all about um, the gender diversity bring different 
skills, talents, and creativity together, right? It's, 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 uh, and these are very critical if you have to develop that your um, um, bring a different view about issues. Um, also, when, when it comes to you um, trying to roll out products, trying to develop products, we also bring in, um, bring in this aspect that you as a man, you have never thought of because you're building in that product for the public and you expect both male and female to use the same product, right? So we need to bring in that um, our own perception. Okay, can we use this color? Oh, this color is more appealing to the female gender and all that. So that, that's what we bring in within the fintech space. Um, um, we're deep thinkers in summary. That, that's what I would say. And there are so many benefits if you have this um, gender diversity within your business. It's, it's, it has been said that when you have companies that have um, female in the senior role, um, they tend to outperform um, the other counterpart that has no female within the senior role. So that, that shows there is something special about having a gender diversity. There's something special about having um, women within your team. Um, there's this saying that, 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 that says, uh, if you don't make an important decision if you don't have a woman on the table. Um, I think that that is very important. And gender diversity in tech also helps to create a product that everyone um, um, can use because once you roll it out, you have made all the consideration or oh, what if, if a female wants to use this product? Does this color appeal to them or that color appeal to them and all that? So th those are the things um, the female gender bring into the fintech space. And if, if you also look at it, it's also a way of gradually closing the wage gap. Okay, you're trying to empower the female folks uh, um, you're trying to ensure that the women have financial freedom and independence. And let me just say, bringing in more women into the space isn't just good for the women; it's good for everybody. So it's it's very good. We we bring we make that um, um, balance. Bringing more people, bringing more women, um, actually bring bringing more balance to the workspace. And this just reminds me of what uh, Christine Lagarde uh, said. She said uh, the financial crisis that we experience uh, because of the Lehman Brothers. Maybe if we had the Lehman Sisters, that wouldn't have, wouldn't have happened. But <laughs> who knows? <laughs> and uh, let, let's uh, take the conversation further. Now we see, you know, the the male counterparts do it'll you know, get the lion's share of our funding. What do you think uh, the women can do to actually? you know, balance uh, the amount of funding coming into the industry? Okay, I, I think one, one important thing we should all focus on is what, what is the, what, what are the investors thinking, okay? Um, if we understand what the investors are thinking, it will also help the women, fo um, uh, the women folks to kind of um, understand how to um, get favor or get that access to funding. Okay, for an investor, what an investor is looking for in a startup is um, to invest in a startup that has an exceptional um, growth potentials, right? Uh, not just, oh, we have this product we want to roll, roll out and I I'm trying to invest in it. The investor will have to ensure that this startup has an exceptional growth um, um, potentials. And if your company has been, been around for a while, Investor also want to ensure that this company will continue to expand, right? So if you're trying to um, um, like approach an investor, I think the first thing you would do is to ask yourself, um, this is my product or my company, do I really have the potentials to grow, right? That's what they are looking for. So if, if you take off a product to them and they feel, oh, we don't have, um, like um, last, last month I was in Kenya, for the Nairobi African Summit. And um, I happened to have it, um, speak to an investor and I told him about our products, what we are building in Yellow Card. And he said, oh, wow, that's quite interesting, but I don't have appetite for this, right? So investors also do have appetite for some products. They ha do have appetite for other products. And they won't have, some of them don't have appetite for your own products, right? So what you can do to ensure you get the right funding is first believe in yourself. I, I find um, 
um, oftentimes I find some women um, don't have that, that courage or they don't believe that they can do what they're actually doing. So the first thing I want a female founder to do is first to believe in herself that I can do this. Notwithstanding the, the number of no's I get, I'll keep pushing until I get it. And the second thing I will say is take your time to do a very nice deck, right? Because even before you speak to an investor, you have to submit um, your proposal to the investor and the investor will have to go through it and see, do I really want to talk to this person or there is no need? So if you need to get professionals to support you in preparing a deck, please prepare a very good deck and sell yourself even before you meet the investor. And also ensure you sell your product well. Not every investor you meet will give you a yes. Most of them will actually give you a no. You can meet a hundred of them and you just get 90 no's and you get 10 yes. But what I would say is ensure your product or your company has the potential to grow. Secondly, ensure you put up a deck that represents what your product is. Sell yourself well and don't be discouraged. Just keep pushing somebody there. There is some. There is always right. somebody there to help. There is okay. always somebody there to to fund your your product. I, I guess uh, keep pushing. No matter how many no's you get, at some point uh, you get a yeah. So I guess we'll leave it there now. Thank you so much, uh, Lasby Oludimi, Vice President Legal and Chief Data Protection Officer at Yellow Card Financial. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right, so yeah, we're talking uh, women in fintech uh, there. Well, we'll take the conversation further after the break. Apex Commodities Market, that's next. Do stay with us this business morning. Next uh, commodity market uh, update. Now, let's get a summary of what happened uh, last week on the exchange. Last trading week, uh, there was an increase across the uh, majority of the key indicators. I saw a four times uh, increase in turnover from 0 0.77 billion naira to 3.89 uh, billion naira. Also, total volume of the commodities traded increased four times uh, from about 2.3 million contracts to 11 million contracts. Number of deals increased by 6%, closing the week at 283 deals. However, the AFEX commodity index declined marginally by 1.06% closing at 471.64 index points, while the AFEX export index gained marginally by 0.30%, closing at 225.58 uh, index points. The volume of contracts uh, traded, we see there soybean stood as the top uh, traded commodity, followed by maize, saw an increased volume across maize, soybean, cocoa, uh, ginger, and uh, cashew price there. And for privacy, uh, soybean topped the gainers chart, gaining 3.58% week on week uh, to close at 362 naira, 82 kobo uh, per kilogram. So it's closely followed by cocoa, which gained 1.05% to close at 1,977 naira uh, for a kilogram. Among the losers, we see cashew. Uh, that uh, topped the laggards chart, declining 6.87% to close the week at 614 naira uh, per kilogram. So it's followed closely also by maize, which dipped by 5.95% to close at 220 naira 94 kaba per kilogram. And that was a performance on the exchange there. So let's uh, take the conversation further. And we're still uh, looking at uh, women participation in the, ag in the agricultural industry. We see an African female farmer uh, as a farmer who bears all the burden of food production on her tired, busy shoulders with little or no access to land, credit, technology, and market. In Sub-Saharan Africa, only 15% of landholders are women and they uh, receive less than 10% of credit and 7% of extension services compared to their male counterparts. Uh, let's see what can be done to close this gap. We have Nancy Lisa Kwe, Vice President, Clearing and Settlement at Apex. Uh, great to have you on the show and happy International Women's Day. Thank you so much and thanks for having me. So definitely, it's, it's time to unlock uh, investment opportunities that create market linkages, access to inputs, training on uh, post-harvest uh, techniques and seed production you know, to alleviate the constraints women farmers will face to, to stay ahead of the curve. Uh, the crucial question now is what are the necessary infrastructures to drive you know, this development? 
Okay, thank you very much for that important question. Um, I would like to um, appreciate, for, uh, appreciate you for the moment like this. Um, I would like to mention categorically that in Apex, we are trying to build physical structures. Um, we're also building um, technological structures that are supporting um, trade systems um, across the um, country, and we're also scaling to other countries of the uh, other countries of the continent. Um, particularly in the area of infrastructure, we are building warehouses. Currently, we have over. 130 um, warehouses across Nigeria. In Kenya and Rwanda, we have uh, more warehouses um, spread across um, those areas. In addition to those warehouses, we have um, farmers are able to come store in the warehouses. So we have um, innovative technology that supports um, inventory management. What we have put in place is um, that uh, particular technology um, re referencing um, Workbench in particular is a, is a technology that actually supports um, bringing farmers' um, data into the system, more like um, providing a digital um, platform for the farmers. So um, by that, by extension, the farmers are able to have like a digital footprint on our systems. They're able to bring in their inventory, store in our warehouse. We raise warehouse receipts which can be traded on the exchange, granting them access to market. In addition to granting access to market, the warehouse receipts are being um, kept in form of um, um, soft copies and they can be collateralized and used as a um, form of getting finances um, from the capital market as well. So um, that kind of infrastructure is what we are building at AFEX. In addition to um, the technological space, we also have um, a cleaning facility, which we, we, which we um, launched last year. Um, the facility has capacity of actually cleaning over 100,000 metric ton of selected um, commodities. So those are the kind of investment that APEX is bringing on board. And we're, we're happy we're supporting the government of the, of the country and also governments of the continent in actually bringing these um, infrastructures to bear. And uh, also identified uh, one issue is uh, low decision-making uh, power stemming from culture norms, influence. Uh, that's also hindered uh, women in agriculture. What, what are some you know, sustainable ways uh, this can actually be overcome? Okay. Um, you, you do notice that um, women in agriculture actually contribute um, close to 43% um, of the entire labor force of um to to the entire workforce of agriculture in the continent the key um take home is that despite the fact that agriculture contributes close to 80 percent of um what the food we actually consume on the continent the women are the ones who bear this burden However, these women actually involve in double, they have, they kind of run double labor day. In the morning, they are taxed with the fact that they have to go to the field to actually fetch fuel that they need to cook in their homes. They also are burdened with the fact that they have to go look for water that they can use to cook in their homes. This makes them actually very tired. They are unable to actually um, contribute their quota to production. What in essence I'm trying to say is that there's need for investment in expansion of the infrastructure that relates to um, supply of water, supply of electricity that can enable them to actually invest in maybe good cooking um, facilities in their homes that can reduce the unpaid hours on, or wasted hours they use in home chores and they can channel that energy into um, the production of more agricultural um, output. In another front, um, farmers actually, uh, female farmers in particular, do have access to technology. This is actually um, reducing the exposure they have because one, Apart from the fact that they are time poor, bearing in mind that they have two labor hours, a uh, two labor day they run. Also, another um, instance is that they also do not have access to innovative information that can help them to drive production in their in their um, space of production. Another key challenge that these farmers actually, female farmers actually face in particular is the fact that they do not have access to land, just a, a little bit. Um, above 10 percent um, of the far 15 percent of these farmers have access to land and we cannot end 
poverty without actually supporting um, or blocking these loopholes. We need to grant women more access to land so they can um, take ownership of the lands, improve the um, uh, output of that land, and then improve the um, output of the economy as a whole. About two, 20 to 30 percent of um, output is actually possible, like incremental output is actually possible if we support farmers and female farmers in the areas of access to land, access to credit, and access to um, information technology that can help them to have predictive um, information as to weather forecasts and the likes. Even granting them more access to credit, increasing um, um, the access of um, credit they have, um, they will be able to actually increase their production as a result of that. So these are the things we are calling out for. Um, we need f more female farmers to be able to um, farm more, support their families, support Africa as a whole in increasing the gap in food production and also um, bridge the gap in food security. In Apex, we've actually... Um, taking the steps forward um, to actually anchor some of our strategies because we do know that strategy actually brings focus. So we've um, kind of aligned some of our goals to the SDG goals. And some of the SDG goals we have um, kind of focused on is um, one of the SDG is no um, hunger. Um, another one is um, closing SDG 5, closing the gap in gender inequality. Another of the SDG goals we've actually focused on is um, the agenda that tries to eliminate poverty. Now, you cannot eliminate poverty if you don't close the gender gap. Like I mentioned, 20 to 30 percent additional food production, equivalent to um, food that can uh, actually feed close to 150 million people, is being lost as a result of non inclusion of um, female farmer in the agricultural space. And definitely uh, boosting output is, is critical uh, at this point. But how do you think uh, we can uh, prioritize digital literacy training for women, you know, that encourage inclusivity and uh, help women learn skills and, uh, you know, boost uh, their learning of, of skills that they do not have to be able to, you know, stand in, in a market that is actually male dominated? Uh, interesting question there. Um, so we, we need to start with the fact that um, it, um, about 20 uh, women are less likely to actually have access to um, mobile devices. Um, that is one. So about 23% um, of women um, in the continent do not have access to mobile devices. So we need to first of all start by closing that, lo that loophole. In addition to that, um, we need to... Um, work in areas that um, advance um, areas of digital payment. For example, if a female is able to actually get access to um, payments on her phone, she's able to decide when to spend it without bothering about um, being controlled or being advised or the money being stolen. Um, in, in FX, we've actually focused on ensuring that uh, we support even from the grassroots because at some point we've actually um, taken up initiatives or working with some banks to see how we can uh, support the enrollment of BVN. So that's one thing we've actually done in Apex. Another way we can also ensure that women um, get um, digital um, support is also um, when they have access to the kind of markets we have. The infrastructure Apex has been referring to the um, COMEX app we have. Um, women are able to actually um, trade from the comfort of their home without bothering about transporting because even wasting of time is also um, part of the losses they incur because they do not have so much time. Remember, I mentioned that female actually are exposed to time poverty. So we need to actually see how we can encourage them to use um, technology like that of FX, the COMEX. They can trade from the comfort of their home. Payment is being made to them. The, all they need to do is get to our accredited warehouse, deposit the inventory, and they can trade. Another thing we can also support them is, um, like I mentioned earlier, that we have an inventory system which also serves like a biodata system. That system helps to give the woman like a digital footprint. It gives her a digital identity on the map, on the, on the agricultural map. 
What this entails is that she, her credit profile can be traced um, from that platform. She has an identity. She can get her inventory into our warehouse. It will be securitized. It will be collateralized at the same time, and she can get access to credit as a result of that. Another way we can actually support female farmers is actually by um, granting them access to these digital devices so they can get access to information that allows them to have um, predictive information like weather changes or new technologies that are evolving in the um, agricultural uh, landscape. So women really need to be allowed to and trusted with the fact that the mobile phone is just not a device for social interaction, but that the device is a, is, is a channel for her to um, learn new things, learn new agricultural practices is get access to market, get access to fair trade, get access to information that can enhance her productivity and in the long run enhance the uh, economic output of not just her herself because when a woman is empowered agriculturally, what she does is that she empowers her family in area of, of nutrition, the family does better and then even the um, extended family, we Africans, we actually benefit from the output of the, fa of the female farmer. Right, so so much uh, technology for them to learn there, but it's always a, a good place to start any day. Just start learning the technology. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Nancy Olisakwe, Vice President Clearing and Settlement at Apex. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, we'll take a moment now. To another market now, we have uh, Will Ebong here to give us uh, the details. Will, happy International Women's Day. And first, I want to ask you, um, how does it feel being a woman in the capital market? How do you handle a bear market as a woman? <laughs> Lady, you know, well, Africans, let's just say, we, we tend to be too cautious. And then being a woman, then being able to take risk is something that we, you know, we overthink things sometimes. Mm. And then it, it tends to affect, you know, our investing, you know, habits and, and the, next the, thing, the appetite the, the that we have. the market leaves you uh, while you're sometimes, still trying to make a decision. Sometimes, but we do go in there when we have that, when we have that clarity in terms of how the market is moving, the trend, and when we start Study it, just like you talk about yeah. trends. We, we can study this, know digitally that we this is the right part to go. We actually put our money there and we, you know, we're fantastic because I just jump in. Like, <laughs> it looks like it's gonna go up and I just jump in. And then you tell me later, oh, no, uh, I made a loss. Oh, Will, I made a uh, loss. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, happy International Women's Day to everyone out there. And, you know, the, we're just starting off with the bonds market where trading was bullish. It's not very good for investors as the average yield fell by eight basis points. 12.9%. And now, across the benchmark curve, we saw a six basis point yield decline at the short end, while at the long end, it fell by 13 basis points. And this is due to investors' demand for the April 2023 paper and the April 2049 paper. But when we look at the average yield, uh, the mid segment was flat. Now, the, we look at the NCB market, we see that at the Treasury bills market, we saw the market traded with bullish sentiments as well. Yields are still going down there. And the average yield also contracted by 37 basis points to 3.7%. Now, across the curve, we saw the average yield falling at the short end. And this is following interest on the 93 days to maturity bill. And on the other hand, we saw average yield close flat at the mid and the long sell segment. Elsewhere, the OMO segment, we see that average yield was flat at 3%. Now let's talk to Chuka Mwachuku, Head Asset and Liability Management, UBA, to give us more insight as to what's happening in the market. Good morning, Chuka. How, should I say Happy International Women's Day to the women working at UBA? <laughs> yeah, um, good, uh, good morning, Will, and uh, Happy International Women's Day to, to you and then all the women in the world. Thank you so much. And you wonder why uh, I have you as a man here. You know, I'm going to do a gender, you know, parity here, gender equality. I'm balancing here. So, Chuka, no, so lad, you don't, nobody should say, why do I have a man on today? Because, you know, we have to be balanced. There's gender equality. So what would you say, Chuka, is the general sentiment in terms of movement in yields? We, you know, last week up until the week, you know, Monday, we saw like, like an uptrend in the treasury bills and the bond space. But it seems it was shortly. What can you say is the general sentiment in terms of bonds and treasury uh, uh, and the treasury bills market for investors? Yeah, the sentiment uh, has been mixed. Um, generally, the sentiment is um, 
uh, is affected by the um, huge system liquidity we've seen uh, over the past uh, few weeks and months. Um, we've seen uh, liquidity uh, uh, moved from uh, uh, 300 billion um, to 1 trillion um, at, a, at a particular point in time. And that's system liquidity I'm talking about now. And so that has affected uh, the, the trading sentiment. So we've seen a lot of people a um, lot of traders um, trying to invest in the um, in the bond market, especially uh, especially the 2028 bond and then the 2037 um, and 49. Um, this is just to um, help manage liquidity and as well as um, help manage uh, CRO and debits. And so uh, it has also affected the um, TBUs market as well, uh, where we've seen the um, rate move. Okay. So- um, about uh, seven hundred and yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Okay, so you, you, I heard you talk about the treasury bills market. I do know that we have a treasury bill market, primary market auction taking place today, where we are having about two hundred and twenty-four billion naira on offer. Where do you see investors playing in this auction? Yeah, um, the the auction today, uh, like you rightly mentioned, is about two hundred and twenty-four billion. Uh, the last auction uh, was about um, uh, two weeks ago, where we saw a significant uh, movement in yield, um, about a several hundred and seventy-six uh, basis point movement um, from uh, two uh, two point four levels to uh, nine point nine um, percent. Um, for this auction, we expect to see um, a higher uh, movement in yield as well, um, say between around um, nine. Between ten percent to about the ten, I mean, between ten percent to about the eleven, twelve, thirteen percent. So um, it's it's looking good on the youth side, especially on the TBU side. Um, so we expect that um, at the end of today's auction, and that we also see some income movement in youth like, like the last auction. Okay, so thank you so much, Ukanwachuku, Head Assets and Liability Management at UBA. Thanks for sharing your thoughts with us, and we'll see how the market will play out today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And so that's how we rolled for the uh, fixed income market. But for the equities market, still, uh, well, it's bearish for the equities market. 0.0% down flat, would say. Now, still sitting at 55,603.94 points. Market cap still at the 30 trillion era mark. And then we're hoping that um, there'll be an uptick in yields. If we look at the activity chart yesterday. It was a sea of green. We had 159.51 million units of shares traded, valued at 2.52 billion era and all transacted in over 4,100 deals. Look at sectoral performance with the banking, consumer goods, oil and gas in the red yesterday. MRS did its thing here. It really dragged down the markets. Banking, the Fugas, that's the tier one bank we had access, UBA, FBN Holdings, GT Co. Uh, all down in yesterday's trading sessions. Zenith Bank as well. And consumer goods index was also down. Industrial goods and uh, Lafarge, I mean, Dangote Cement uh, propped up the industrial goods index. Uh, industri- I mean, the insurance was also also up 0.48 percent. Now look at the top losers. We see, I mean, the top trades. We saw Transco uh, hitting 14.42 million units in yesterday's trading session. Zenith Bank uh, up also followed closely 13.26 million units due to sell-offs. As I mentioned, they dragged down the banking index. Now GTCO also saw that that really pulled back the market. A lot of sell-offs in this sector uh, yesterday. Now the top losers, I mentioned MRS yesterday, dragging the market, especially the oil and gas in, I mean, the oil and gas index down 10%, 31 point, 31 naira. It closed at 31 naira, uh, five cobalt, open at 34 naira, 50 cobalt yesterday. So we're seeing that in the market and we're hoping that ma- negative sent- sentiments do not persist as we're seeing on Monday. From Friday up to Monday, we're hoping that today we'll see more um, investors coming to the market, possibly with more risk on and not risk of mood in the market. Now, if you look at the NASD market, it was also in negative territory, 0.81% to sit at 718.97 points. Market cap not up to the 1 trillion naira mark. We're still waiting for that to pop up. Ladi, so... Yeah. so yeah, hopefully the, the bulls can give uh, the women a gift today. Yes, we do need a, a big gift at the NGS. And I'll be going to the NGS and I'll see how the, you know, that Probably that would, you know, incentivize them. So exactly. I just give them the wings, you know, for them, yeah. them to fly. Oh, give us the sail. <laughs> nice bullish clothes. Yes. Thank right. you so much. Oh, uh, well, that was good there. You know, the details for the NGX and.
uh, the fixed income market. Now, moving on to other markets now, we see uh, Bitcoin there did attempt an upside correction, uh, but couldn't uh, sustain it. And see the sentiment in the market there, still 50 points uh, neutral uh, right now. Investors uh, not knowing which direction uh, to go now, whether bullish or bearish. So they're just in the middle, you know, at this time, seeing the uh, price action is quite bearish there with the bulls taking control of the market. Let's uh, look at the market cap this morning, almost losing that $1 trillion uh, mark there, just holding it by a hair's breadth there, just one point. 1.69% down, uh, volume traded, that's up 41.78% uh, with the sell-offs we're seeing in the market today. Bitcoin dominance in at 42.19%. Let's look at the price of Bitcoin uh, this morning, 22,000. Also uh, managing to hold their 22K level, uh, down 1.83% at 8 a.m. Uh, this morning. Might have lost this level at this time. Volume traded, $24.34 billion. Let's look at the price of Ethereum. That's uh, holding the 1,500 level, but it's down 1.23%, 7.16 billion uh, traded in Ethereum. Uh, let's bring in Mary Maswa now, financial market analyst. Uh, hello, Mary, and um, happy International Women's Day. Hi, Ladi. Thank you very much. So uh, going with the theme uh, today, uh, in the global crypto market, what percentage of, of projects are led by women? Well, um, interestingly, according to what was reported in Forbes, uh, out of 121 leading cryptocurrency um, uh, businesses, only five of them are led by women. Um, and after the crypto funds, only 10% of them are made of uh, female partners. So uh, it is still quite quite low, but that doesn't mean that there aren't women who are making major strides in the um, cryptocurrency space. Um, like I can name a lot from the Bitcoin space alone. Um, we have like amazing women like um, Lorraine Marcel, who's leading a Bitcoin Dada, which is a um, organization training women on Bitcoin and how they can empower themselves with Bitcoin. We have uh, the CEO of Thunder Games, um, Desiree Dickerson. She is the she's leading a Bitcoin gaming company. We have the CEO of Lightning Labs, um, Elizabeth Stark. So we have a, quite a number of women doing major things. Um, although, like as more education comes up, I'm sure we'll have more women um, dominating the space soon. All right, let's look at trading strategy now what would you say is the trading strategy you know women adopt more and you know considering we've been in a bear market for a while now so um it's quite different from um the strategy a lot of men use so apparently it is known that a lot of men are um not they're they're more in they're, they're open to taking risks higher risks than women are um, women take higher risks only when they have a, a very good understanding of the asset and the market. And that happens a lot um, in this space. So a good number of women, what they do is they take the approach of, you know, holding lo assets long term. And that's for women who have a deeper understanding of the asset. Um, so that is the strategy they employ. It doesn't mean that there aren't women who are massive risk takers who trade, um, you know, cryptocurrency or Bitcoin on the on an exchange. Like there are a good number of women who do that, but a lot of the women prefer to be more risk averse and, um, you know, save in the long term. I guess it's a risk off for uh, women. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Mary Master and financial market analyst. Thank you. And happy You're International welcome. Women's Day again. <laughs> thank you very much, Ladi. All right. So that's it. That's a uh, trading strategy for women there. Long-term holders, that's according to uh, Mary. But let's look at the top odds by market cap that we see. It's just XRP uh, in the green this morning with the sell-offs we're seeing. Uh, it's up 0.92%. Still managing to hold that 30 cents uh, level. And we see Matic having that pullback 2.71%. And uh, uh, Binance token, the BNB, uh, losing that $300 mark uh, down 0.42%. Uh, so that's how the crypto market is looking. Still no direction at this point. Neutral with the uh, rate hikes. Uh, 
by the Fed, the expectation of rate hikes still impacting uh, this market and other markets. That's a wrap up for the markets now, and that's it on the program today. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to join us by 1.30 on Business Incorporated for more updates and developments in the world of business. And you can watch this again on our YouTube channel. Just flip over to YouTube, search for Channel Television. You can check all our videos and watch all our productions. And uh, don't forget to subscribe. Thank you for watching. I'm Laddie Williams. Bye for now. Thank you.